I came to say condolences. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Have you recovered since then? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think I've gotten over it. You know, there's always next year. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Also, uh, I, I checked decisions on SCOTUS blog the other day, and uh, I think you would not be very interested in this week's decisions. They were extremely technical. Ah, okay. Are you off this afternoon then? Uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. I'm enjoying your talks. You know, every, every you. ten years, it's good to hear a talk about this stuff. Okay. <laughs> I actually gave a talk in the Banks Dine time. I don't remember when it uh, was. Yeah, that was in ten. That ah, so that 2010. 2010. So that was. I think you heard it then. Yeah. So that was only five years. Okay, five years. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the stuff very, today would be different. Yeah. No, no, well, it's the same. Different. I have a very different perspective on the audience, but it's kind of interesting to sit there and kind of translate things and then think about all of these dualities. And, uh, well, you know, I think I think actually yeah. my perspective is closer to yours than that of the audience. Well, uh, yeah, because I mean, you know, somehow. Yeah, I'm making analogies with the uh, with no, things no, they never heard no, about. The analogies, I'm just sitting there translating. Then I have to think. <laughs> oh, but he's dealing with sort of symmetric gauge theories, which are kind of a foreign thing for you know for a lattice person, and so yeah. I have to remember he's got the bosons. He says he's right. extra. You know, you have these That's extra. Right. You have these extra hooks. That's right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Then no, but I, no, I was shocked when I said this is how it's told the boss of the Ada Prime, and they never heard about the Ada Prime. And Why they? Uh, what? Yeah. Why should they? I mean, even lattice people mostly are not. Lattice students are not. Some of them. Okay, really? Some Don't know about the Ada Prime? Thing. That was a major thing. In, I know, uh, it absolutely was. Yeah, it was a real breakthrough. Yeah. Is there a place you go to for minor medical things that you're so, uh, that's a good question. Um, there's an insect bite that seems to be infected. Okay. I look on the web and they say, go see your doctor. Um, yeah. Um, I would drop in to the emergency room at the hospital, but that's because it's right across the street from where I live. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that there are sort of little clinics around in town, you know, sort of. Sort okay, so I'll just look them up. I don't want you to check there was nothing that you could use in the past. So I'll just There's just nothing really. I mean, I would call my doctor on that. Right, right. I'm a little bit too embedded here. I know that there was. No, I'm the same way as in a bar Yeah. Yeah. I just thought there might be a history of students turning themselves. Uh, there isn't, but it's, fortunately it's rare. Uh, so we, we want a special case. Okay, I'll, ju I'll just use Google. Yeah, yeah, look around. I mean, the, the old hospital is up on Broadway, about a mile north of here, and they are gradually moving all of their operations out to my neighborhood, which is east on Arapaho. But I remember that there was some sort of, uh, you know, sort of a simple emergency care place sort of across the street from you. And, are, are you and there's a Kaiser place up there, too. I mean, you're not. Oh, no, yeah, no, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, 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 I'm only, it's only the internet has scared me, but it says, go see your doctor. Well, yeah. you know, we have ticks, right? Yeah. 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 yeah.
we starting? Oh, 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 did, um, we did kind of end late, but, but um, you know, we don't need a whole hand. Here, here, is, here is Nadia all poised and ready to Oh, leave. is it already? It's not already. Uh, wait, you started. It's 10 to 11. It's 10 to 11. Oh, my God. So we supposed to, should we supposed to start five minutes ago? Yeah, except you started late. Okay. And, okay. and everybody was so happy. I mean, you, why don't you chase everybody in? I'll chase everybody. We'll, we'll, we'll go on chatting here. Don't do it too too explicitly, because maybe they don't want to come. <laughs> now I reached this stage that you know I couldn't care less whether they come or not. <laughs> No, when I was so young, I wanted everybody to. Okay, so What's that? Well, people say that I did that long ago. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. In a way. No, I was thinking, you know, how, how would I approach these lattice, you know, these duality things as a lattice person? And as a lattice person, you know, I sort of say, I only understand what I'm doing when I'm close to the Gaussian fixed point. And then well, the icing, model, the icing model the icing model is no, a good example. Yeah, no, if you can actually do it. I mean, all the cases I right. know about, you can do it. And well, you if you it. can do it, you can do it. Uh, to, yeah, the surprise is you cannot, right? Yeah, but I mean, the analogy would be, say, going from QCD to pi outs. Right. You know, basically you can't get there, but you notice all these things. Everybody's eagerly waiting. Everybody's Sorry. eagerly waiting. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't believe a word you say. <laughs> Are there any questions about uh, the previous lectures? And again, is the speed too high, too low? Am I assuming you know more than you actually know? Or am I assuming that you know less than you actually know? I cannot believe that I assume exactly right for every single one of you. <laughs> it's a set of measures zero for many, many people. OK. Uh, I felt that it would be bad to talk only about things which are ancient. <laughs> uh, so I thought I would devote the last lecture to something which is more modern. Unfortunately, they still need for a lot of background that, for various reasons, is not being taught. But some of these things that in this background are extremely important in many applications. So what I'll do today is discuss three-dimensional theories. And I'll highlight some of the peculiarities of three dimensions that are different than four dimensions. But we will see, so we'll learn several things. First, we'll learn about these three-dimensional theories. Second, we'll learn about some of these peculiarities of field theories in three dimensions. And the nice thing at the end, if I get to it, which I'm extremely doubtful, is that we'll see that if you look from afar and you don't get into the technicalities, the four-dimensional story is not that different than the three-dimensional story, which is encouraging. Although the details and the technicalities are completely different. So why should we be interested in that? As I said yesterday, the first reason it's there. It's field theory with a different number of dimensions. Some might say that it's easier because it's in no dimensions. In fact, I'll show that in some cases it's harder. You can also say that there are many more three-dimensional interacting field theories than four-dimensional field theories. I'll explain why. There are more relevant operators. There are more interactions we can turn on that have interesting dynamics. And there might be applications in condensed matter physics. And in fact, some of the ideas of duality, topological field theory that I'll talk about, and so forth, are extremely popular in condensed matter physics. So I'll start by discussing some new elements that exist in three dimensions and are not present in four dimensions. The first thing is that in four dimensions, we had a bound on the number of matter fields that we can have. If we have too many matter fields, the theory is not asymptotically free. And then it's not, strictly speaking, a quantum field theory. It's only an effective theory in the infrared. And therefore, it's not going to do anything exciting at long distance. In three dimensions, we don't have such a bound. Every three-dimensional gauge theory is asymptotically free. In fact, the coupling doesn't only even run logarithmically. It runs faster because the gauge coupling constant has a dimension. So they have many more interacting field theories in three dimensions than in four dimensions. These superconformal field theories, that I had a few of them in the, my last lecture, in three dimensions, there are many more of them. In fact, for any number of flavors and colors, the theory is interacting. This is the typical thing that happens in these theories. Second, we can consider abelian gauge theories. In four dimensions, abelian gauge theories 
do not exhibit infra interesting dynamics in the infrared. It's associated with the fact that the theory is not asymptotically free. In three dimensions, they do. So we can learn a lot of things from a billion gauge theories. And again, this is something that is extremely important for condensed matter physics. They have a billion gauge fields, and they can interact, and they can do all sorts of things. And with abelian gauge theories, we can also have more knobs to turn. We can turn on these Faye-Eliopoulos terms, which do appear in the first half of Wes and Bagger. They can be analyzed classically in four dimensions. In three dimensions, they could affect the dynamics in an interesting way. There are also more coupling constants. I'll discuss them in more detail later. For example, we can, if we have a gauge theory, we can turn on a churn simons term. So this is an integer, but it's still a knob we can turn. And as we have more knobs to turn, we can find richer phenomena and also get more diagnostics of known phenomena. Because we have another parameter, we take it to extreme values where we can analyze what we're doing and then go back to the point we are really interested in. And related to all that, we can have richest phase structure that we can have in, in uh, four dimensions. So all that is true even without supersymmetry. But with supersymmetry, we have everything that we had in four dimensions and more. And the main reason for that is that there are many more terms we can write down that are gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant in three dimensions, and they are not Lorentz invariant in four dimensions. For example, if we write the term which is a four-dimensional vector, in four dimensions, we are not going to add that to the Lagrangian. If we just reduce this term to three dimensions, the four-dimensional vector splits into a three-dimensional vector and a scalar, and the scalar is another term we can add to the Lagrangian. We'll use that a lot in our discussion. So far, we talked only about the superpotential in four dimensions as being a BPS quantity, something that is invariant under half the supersymmetries, but not invariant under the other half. With more supersymmetries, we can have particles that are in small representations. They are annihilated by half the supersymmetries. Operators can be BPS or can be chiral in four dimensions. They can also be chiral in three dimensions. But, up, but particle states cannot be. Related to that, but they can be if we have more supersymmetries. Related to that is that we can have such BPS strings in four dimensions. So in four dimensions with n equals 1 supersymmetry, we can have BPS, namely, annihilated by half the supersymmetries. We cannot have BPS particles, but we can have BPS strings. Let's reduce that to three dimensions. So that if something is not BPS, too bad. It's not going to become BPS. But if we have a string, which is BPS in four dimensions, we can wrap it on the circle as we compactify. And therefore, we can find BPS particles in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, we have a new thing in the spectrum. We have particle excitations that are BPS. And since they're BPS, we can exactly compute their masses. So there are more things that we can compute. And therefore, it's getting more fun. <coughs> Examples of these particles are things known as skirmions, vortices. They're very popular in condensed matter physics. They have interesting properties. And if the theory is supersymmetric, they can be BPS. And therefore, we can analyze them exactly. We'll also see that there are interesting operators that cannot be written in a simple form, in a single, simple local form, in, uh, in, the, uh, in terms of the dynamical fields in the Lagrangian. This thing exists already in four dimensions. In four dimensions, we can discuss the Wilson line, which is an exponential of, a of the connection, or more mathematically, the holonomy. But there's also a dual object known as the Etouffe line, which is defined by removing a line out of space-time and specify the singularity of the gauge field near this line. This is the Etouffe line. In three dimensions, we, can, we have one more thing. We can take this four-dimensional Etouffe line and wrap it on the circle, and it will give us an Etouffe particle or an Etouffe local operator in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, there are local operators. They are the descendants of the Etouffe line in four dimensions. We have such local operators. And in the discussion, we can have more interesting operators we can discuss. They might be chiral. They might be BPS. We might want to understand their dynamics, their dimensions, their correlation functions, and so forth. I'll ex construct them very explicitly. So let me start with the first term, 
that is new in, in three dimensions, and it has nothing to do with supersymmetry. So we should distinguish what can and what cannot be in a supersymmetric theory. And it comes under the name real mass. This is a terrible name, by the way, but there's nothing I can do about that. So in four dimensions, the mass term is complex. I'm using two, uh, two component notation. We can write this thing with a complex parameter m, or we can write its complex conjugate, which is m bar, psi bar alpha dot, psi bar alpha dot. I hope you, un you know this notation. So such a mass parameter is always complex. In, four, in three dimensions, there is one more thing we can do with the fermion. We can write, I'll use the same notation m, psi alpha, psi bar alpha. One way to understand that is that in three dimensions, there is no difference between alpha and alpha dot. If I ignore signature and so forth, and the global structure, the Lorentz group in four dimensions is SU2 times SU2. So every representation is, is, is described in terms of two spins for the two SU2s. Alpha is a spinner index for one of them, and alpha dot is the spinner index of the other one. In three dimensions, the Lorentz group is SU2. And since it's SU2, there's only one index, alpha. And therefore, this is such a term. We can write such a term. And this m is real. So I'll, do, I'll call, put here, this is complex. In a four-dimensional person would say that this term started its life in four dimensions as psi alpha, psi bar alpha dot, with sigma mu alpha alpha dot. So this term studied its life as a vector in four dimensions. And one see, thing we'll see a lot in this talk is that if we start in four dimensions, we can always try and derive the three-dimensional theory by compactifying the three-dimensional, the four-dimensional theory on the circle. So we start in four dimensions, we compactify the theory on the circle, and we derive a three-dimensional theory. So in four dimensions, we cannot add such a term to the Lagrangian. That would violate Lorentz invariance. But if the index here mu is precisely the index that is the circle that we reduce on, this is a scalar in three dimensions. And therefore, we can add such a term. This term is very interesting. It's interesting because it violates parity. One way to understand that is as follows. Imagine we have a particle, not a field, but a particle. And it's massive, so it sits at a point. We have this lo uh, notion of the little group, the subgroup of the Lorentz group that still acts on the particle at rest. So it can the only thing it could do is spin. And therefore, the little group in three dimensions is u1. Basically, rotation, if we embed the two-dimensional space in three dimensions, it is as if the spin of the particle is always perpendicular to the plane. In four dimensions, positive spin and negative spin are related to each other for massive particles by a Lorentz transformation. Something is rotated this way, I can just turn it around and let it rotate the other way. In three dimensions, the only notion of spin is spin along an axis perpendicular to the plane of space. And if we want to change the di direction of the spin, we have to rotate it and it will no longer be orthogonal to the plane. So in three dimensions, spin s, which is a number, it's a representation of u1, going to minus s is parity. It's not Lorentz transformation. Lorentz. So in three dimensions, changing the sign of the spin is a parity transformation. And in the case of the fermion, it's correlated with, this, with the sign of m. So now it's clear why such a term, such a real mass term, violates parity. If we flip the sign of the mass, the particle does not rotate this way, it rotates this way. And this is, these two are related to each other by parity, but not by a Lorentz transformation. I can also do it group theoretically, embedding it in SO4. There's an SO4 transformation that relates one to the other, but from a three-dimensional perspective, this is parity.
What am I doing? So now let's take a theory and couple it. I'm still without supersymmetry. I'm taking such a theory and I'm coupling it to a gauge field. So we'll make it simple. Let's couple it to a U1 gauge field. And this U1 gauge field might be classical or might be quantum mechanical. This is a, an issue that we'll have to address later when we decide whether we want to do the functional integral over this gauge field or not. But at the moment, let's keep it classical, but it's arbitrary. And we couple it to a fermion. So option one, we have a fermion with these mass terms, the complex mass terms. But if we have a complex fermion, so psi is a complex fermion, it's complex because it transforms under u1, goes to e to the i alpha psi under the u1 transformations. In four dimensions, if we have such a fermion, we cannot give it a Lorentz invariant mass. Because in order to give a mass, we have to multiply psi with psi or psi bar with psi bar. That would violate charge conservation. In three dimensions, we can. We can write such a mass term, psi psi bar. This is this real mass. Again, I remind you, this is this real mass term. So this is a Lorentz invariant mass. For a two, we have a two-dimensional spinor representation. It's complex, transforms under the U1 gauge transformations, and we can give it a mass. So this is something we cannot do in four dimensions. Now, since the particle is massive, the right thing to do is integrate it out. This is just evaluating the determinant. There cannot be something simpler than that. We have just one loop diagram of the fermion, but we couple it to a gauge field. So we have diagrams like that when we integrate out the massive fermion. So we're not going to do the calculation, but I'm going to tell you the answer. The answer is i over 8 pi, m over m absolute value. OK, you can think of this as being the sine of m, times ADA, which is plus or minus i over 8 pi ADA. So when I integrate out the massive fermion, I induce a churn simons term in the gauge theory, even if it wasn't there before. Now, something is easy to check. I said that flipping the sign of the mass is like performing a parity transformation. Parity flips the sign of the mass. And indeed, it flips the sign of the churn simons term. So at high energies, parity acts by flipping the sign of m. At low energies, parity flips the sign of the churn simons term, and we see that this is consistent. But what's really interesting here is the coefficient. So the fact that you, take, you integrate out something that violates parity and you induce something that violates parity, that's not too surprising. But what is interesting here is the coefficient. So I'll have a little aside about coefficient of churn simons terms. On any manifold in three dimensions, the churn simons term, if we want the churn simons term to be well defined on every single manifold, the normalization should be 1 over 2 pi ADA. That's on any manifold. If we limit ourselves to spin manifolds with a specific spin structure, the gauge configurations are restricted because we don't have all possible gauge configuration. Because we, we cannot, cannot have more complicated situations arising when it's not spin. And if we further pick the spin structure and we allow the answer to depend on the spin structure, then the proper normalization is 1 over 4 pi ADA. Now, in our problem, we have fermions. So we should better limit ourselves to this case. So the churn simons term, properly quantized, must be a multiple of 1 over 4 pi the coefficient. Otherwise, it's not gauge invariant. But this seems strange, because I just told you that we integrated out a fermion, and we got a churn simons term with coefficient 1 over 8 pi. So we did a well-defined calculation, so it seems, and we got a nonsensical answer. So if we started the short distance with the theory as I described it with a massive fermion, I integrated out, everything looks right, except that the answer does not make sense. The answer is not gauge invariant. Does anybody know what such a phenomenon is called? 
Whenever you follow your nodes, you do a calculation, you get something that is not gauge invariant, it's always called an anomaly. That's the rule. So that's called an anomaly. In fact, it's called a parity anomaly. So let me explain that better. What we learn from this computation is that if we start at short distance from the theory with just the gauge fields, no other term, coupled to the fermion, and we integrate out the fermion, we find something that doesn't make sense. So how can we fix that? In order to make the problem really well defined, I know what the logical problem is. If I start with the front plot board rather than, you know, unfortunately it took me three and a half lectures to figure it out. So fix. Uh, no, I have not, but it is. Well, we're already, we already in trouble with one loop. Actually, I did. Sorry, I did. Because the gauge, the gauge field is classical. Since the gauge field is classical, there is no other diagram. Now, if the gauge field is not classical, there, there could have been corrections here, but the corrections would be proportional to the gauge coupling. And the gauge coupling is dimensionful, and therefore it cannot happen. Yep, yep. It, this is again one of the characteristics of the anomalies that there's an apparent violation of, of a decoupling. But that's not a confusion. It's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> and in any event, it's not a confusion. This is fully understood. Well, since in the previous lecture you gave the speaker a hard time about being imprecise with the language. <laughs> So we're going to fix it, because it looks like the, the way I described the theory doesn't make any sense. Took the theory, just the fermion, we coupled it to A, the A, was, A wasn't even dynamical. We integrated it out, and the answer de depends on A in a nonsensical way. Fix. Add in the UV. This is called a counter term. And we can do that in two different ways, either with a plus sign or with a minus sign. More generally, we can edit, let me write it like that. We can put here any odd number, positive or negative, multiplying the eight pi square. So the term with n, it's just a regular counter term. It respects all the symmetries. It's well defined. We always have an ambiguity in it. The important thing here is that we add, so the even the two n path is al there's always freedom in that. But what's more interesting is the plus one. We add something that does not make sense. But this term that does not make sense, the oddness of this number, is exactly cancel exactly cancels the part that does not make sense in the fermions. So if we want to define the theory with a fermion, and I say, oh, we couple it to a gauge field, we have to remember to add this term. Now everything is great, because as we go in the IR, we get this i over 8 pi, the 2n plus 1 that we just copy from here, and then plus m over m absolute value, a dA. And then this is always an even number. So it's a multiple of 1 over 4 pi, and therefore it makes sense. So the lesson is that in order to make sense out of a theory of a single fermion coupled to a gauge field, we must add at short distance a bare, improperly quantized chern simons term. Otherwise, the answer doesn't make sense. Now. What about the mass equals 0? Take this answer and set the mass to 0. Well, everything I said is still true. There's an ambiguity in the sign of this term. It's either plus or minus 1, depending on how we take the limit. But it's still true that we still have to keep this odd, this improperly normalized Chern Simons term. Yes. 
So what's the lesson here? We start from a theory with a massless fermion. It appears to be parity invariant. I said the sign of the mass breaks parity. So let's set the mass to zero. The theory is parity invariant. But in order to make sense of it, we have to add such a term, which always has a non-zero coefficient, which breaks parity. So this is, again, something which is characteristic in, in anom with anomalies. Anomaly is a situation where you have a list of properties you would like your theory to have, and there is no way to satisfy all of them, so you have to sacrifice one of them. In this case, the clash is between demanding parity and gauge invariance. Gauge invariance would tell us, if we want gauge invariance, we must add such a term. This was the reasoning so far. If instead we insist on parity, we will say, if the theory is massless, let's not add anything. That's fine. The theory is parity invariant. But we cannot couple it to the gauge field, because that would not be gauge invariant. So we have two options, preserve the U1 gauge symmetry or preserve parity. And we have to take our choice. Now, if we are really interested in coupling to a gauge field, that's something that we would like to do. We would later like to sum over it. We would like to couple it to electromagnetism, even if it's weakly coupled. Then we have no choice but to add this term. And then we have to sacrifice parity. So this is known as the parity anomaly. Which one? Well, it, the but statement, it, but yeah. For you, what? For two, it's familiar, yeah, but for you one, it's also true because you imagine space is s two times something. That's then you could have flux. You could have flux through the s two. In this case, the integral of the d a will give you one, and then it would look like a particle, with which which should have properly normalized. So I can actually take say s two times s one, put one monopole flux on the s two, do a gauge transformation that winds around the s one, and derive the quantization. This might not be the most subtle thing, because there might be more elaborate things I could do and get further restrictions that would quantize the system. If you work on R3, then it seems like this, this thing doesn't need to be quantized. But this is, again, imprecise. It's imprecise because you could still consider Wilson lines and monopole operators, which I'll define soon. And if it's not properly quantized, you'll get in trouble there. The, this is the same thing. In general, you can, if you work on R n, you think, ah, there is no topology. I don't have to think about it. But these, some of these monopole operators are defined by removing a point or a line from space-time. By doing that, we induce new topology, because we have new things we could do. We can go around various cycles that are not contractible, because they will have to go through this point we removed. And once we have non-trivial topology, various parameters are quantized. Well, this one also induces a Maxwell term. I, I, I just talked about the, thing, the leading term at low energies. But in, OK, let, since you asked, let me say, what happens if you turn on the other mass? Well, in order to have the other mass, you have to have twice as many fermions, because otherwise you cannot write it. If you have twice as many fermions, the complex mass does not lead to all that. And now we have two masses we can turn on, two real masses for psi 1 and for psi 2. And these masses can induce First of all, it would be a factor of 2, but the, instead of, say, 1 over 8 pi, it could be either 2 over 8 pi, 0 over 8 pi, or minus 2 over 8 pi, depending on both of them are positive, both of them negative, or. But when you say it's irrelevant, I mean, there are other points you get. Well, it's true. Yes. No, it's irrelevant in the, in the sense that it's a, this, this term is more relevant than the other. It's low, it's low momentum. I know what you mean, but that, 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 that saying that it's lower for it, it's not true. Yeah. 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 I'm doing a free field theory. But Eva, this is, this is a free field yeah, theory. Field. Yeah, but gauge field is classical. I'm coupling it to, I'm doing, this is, you see, all this subtlety is a subtlety within free field theory. There are no interactions here. 
It's one loop exact. It's not that it's one quantity that is one loop exact. Everything here in this theory is one loop exact. It's a theory of a free massive fermion. No, not in this theory. This is the theory that at high energies we have a massive fermion, and at low energies we have nothing. It's a gap theory. This is sense from four dimensions. It's a free fermion in four dimensions, reduced on the circle. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. No, no. The gauge field is not dynamical. It does not lead to anything exciting. It's a free theory. The gauge field is classical. See, I don't have something like this. This is an external source. I don't have that. That's fine. You don't need that. For the, for the right. So this effect exists even without these terms. There are no in, in there are no. There is no beta function here. There is no fixed point here. It's a free field theory. I can make it more complicated and add more fields and add more interactions and might be fixed points, but that's not the point. This is a free field theory. Let's start this way. I'll soon make it dynamical, but so far it's classical. There will be fixed points, but so far I really want to emphasize that we do not have to add additional elements to understand that. This, this thing, which is very general, is a property of free field theory. So what, what do we do? We, we take some gauge field, we specify some classical gauge field, and we do the functional integral over the fermions coupled to this gauge field. And since the fermions are massive, we integrate them out, and the low-energy observer sees nothing. And then the low-energy observer says, let's vary A a little bit. And as we vary A, the action changes. So the massive case is just that But that's also true in the massless case. Yes, uh, but I would rather, rather not get into it. Uh, you see, in order to do that, I have to turn on the mass. I have to turn on the mass. And this mass is a mass term that is not, you don't usually add in, in the four-dimensional theory. It does have an interpretation that associated with, again, with anomalies, etc., etc., but I would rather not get into it. I'd like to talk now a little bit about another thing that is new in three dimensions that we did not see in four dimensions. And for that, I'll talk about supersymmetry, but supersymmetry will play very little role in what I'm saying. We studied the gauge field in four dimensions, say f mu square in four dimensions. So we're coming from some a gauge field A. And now we go to 3D. So A mu splits into a three-dimensional A mu and A4. I'm going to call A4 sigma. In the Lagrangian, in four dimensions, we had 1 over G4 square. I'm suppressing coefficients, F mu nu square. And that becomes, in three dimensions, 1 over G4 square times the radius. I'm suppressing 2 pi's and so forth, F mu nu square, plus R over G4 square, same thing, d mu sigma square. And now we give it a name. A three-dimensional person would say that this is 1 over g3 square. This is the gauge coupling as seen by a three-dimensional observer. 
So if we take a photon in four dimensions, we end up in three dimensions with a photon and another scalar sigma. What about the photon? Let's first analyze the photon. The theory of the photon can be dualized to a free scalar field with a kinetic term that has a positive g3 square dA square. Is this familiar or should I do that? Wow. Okay, thank you. So we talked a lot about duality. This is one of the simplest forms of duality. So I'll do the duality transformation explicitly. <laughs> so I'll do it here. So we start with 1 over g3 square f mu nu square. So I talked a lot about duality transformations that can actually be done and proven, and duality is the transformations that are conjectured and we don't know how to do explicitly. So this is an example where we know, do know how to do explicitly. So we start from such a Lagrangian, and now we'll do a set of manipulations that are perfectly valid. First of all, this is a free field theory, so this is something we should be able to do. This f mu nu is d mu a nu minus d nu a mu. But let's give it a name, f mu nu. So we just give it a name. So now it's going to be an independent parameter in the functional integral. But I'm going to add, I'm using Euclidean signature everywhere here. So I'm going to add a Lagrange multiplier. Let's call it A. D mu F mu rho. So what does this Lagrange multiplier do? If we integrate A out, it tells us that F satisfies the Bianchi identity, and therefore it's a proper normal gauge field. It's a, it's a good, good gauge field. In fact, to really be precise, I have to put here 2 pi so that even the global structure is reproduced properly. But let me suppress the 2 pi's from this moment on. So, so far I haven't done anything. I, I gave F a name and added the Lagrange multiplier that forces the fact that it's a field strength. Now I integrate by parts. It's easy to do on the blackboard than in the notes, so I do that. And maybe I flip the sign. That doesn't matter. So now F has no derivatives, and it's just a field with two indices. We can integrate it out because we have a Gaussian integral. When we integrate it out with the Gaussian integral, it's a Gaussian integral, this thing is flipped, so we get G3 square, dA square. So the lesson of this whole thing is that a gauge field in three dimensions is dual to a scalar. In fact, since the gauge theory here is a compact U1, it's U1 rather than R, when we, put, we have two cycles, we can have monopole flux through the two cycle. And in order to satisfy all the quantization conditions, that's why I needed the 2 pi here, but also A should be identified with A plus 2 pi. So A is a compact scalar. So again, this is one of the simplest examples of duality. A compact scalar in three dimensions is the same as a photon in three dimensions. This is also one of the simplest examples of an emergent gate symmetry, because we can run this argument backwards. Start with a compact scalar. It has no gauge symmetry. We run this argument backwards, and we end up with a photon with its gauge symmetry that is emergent. So this was an aside about duality. So now I can rewrite this theory as the, the dual of this photon, A, plus 1 over g3 square d sigma square. So when we reduce a four-dimensional photon to three dimensions, and again, I emphasize this is a free field theory, no interactions, nothing fancy, the photon in four dimensions becomes two scalars in three dimensions. There are two scalars in three dimensions. In fact, both of them are compact. A is compact, as I explained before, because I did, when I do the duality transformation, I need to ensure that the fluxes of this f are properly quantized. Sigma is also compact, because sigma started its life as a four-dimensional gauge field. So sigma is identified with sigma plus 1 over r. The only thing that is meaningful about this a4 is the e to the i line integral of a4 around the, four around the circle that we compactified. 
So if we shift A4 by 1 over R, there might be two pi's everywhere. If we shift A4 by 1 over R, we don't change the holonomy around the circle. So the upshot is, if for this photon, becomes two compact scalars in 3D. We can trace the, pol the polarization. How many degrees of physical degrees of freedom did we have? In four dimensions, we had two, because the photon has either left-handed or right-handed polarizations. In three dimensions, we still have two degrees of freedom. They are compact. And this whole issue of polarization is not there. So these are scalars. Now, if we are one, so this has nothing to do with supersymmetry. But if the problem is supersymmetric, we have this vector multiplet in Western Bagger, which includes a photon and a photino. The photino comes down, becomes, was a fermion, remains a fermion. But this A and sigma combine into a chiral superfield. So let me try and get the normalization straight. We have something like sigma over g square, g3 square, plus IA. This is a complex field, which is the bottom component of a chiral superfield. So this is a complex scalar. So let's again consider our photon going down to three dimensions. We have two scalars. Target space is a torus. And we have a moduli space of aqua. which is T2. So we go down, start with a photon in four dimensions. We don't even need supersymmetry. In three dimensions, we have a target space, which is T2. And as we shrink it, it's going to grow because of all these factors of R that we have here. We know it has to grow because a three-dimensional person, not a person coming from four dimensions, if we're just working on R3, then sigma is no longer compact. So on R3, sigma is non-compact. One way to see that, as we said before, that sigma is identified with sigma plus 1 over R. So as R goes to 0, it becomes non-compact. So the target space if we compactify on a circle is a torus. And if we compactify completely, shrink the circle completely, we have a non-compact sigma and a compact A. Now if the theory is supersymmetric, the same is true. And we have a modular space of vacua. And along this vacua, the U1 symmetry is unbroken, because sigma is neutral. And we refer to such a modular space of vacua as a Coulomb branch. This is terrible terminology here. In four dim because in three dimensions, there is no such thing as Coulomb law anyway. Coulomb law grows at infinity. There are no really real Coulomb fields in the standard sense. So this is a Coulomb branch of vacua. And it's convenient to imp and it's convenient to make the, compactive, the fact that A is compact to consider the field X, which is e to the sigma over g3 square plus IA. So now the periodicity of A is, is well defined, and sigma is non-compact. So this complex field X describes the va different vacua. There is another interpretation of this x. We can define a new kind of operator. I already alluded to that earlier. This is the Tooft operator. It's, Tooft did it in four dimensions. We'll do that just in three dimensions. So we remove a point. So the title is monopole operators.
So remove a point from R3. And say that the field strength F normally satisfies the Bianchi identity. So DF is normally 0. But we are going to say that it's no longer 0, but it's 2 pi times three-dimensional delta function at the origin. This is the point we removed. So now, when we consider the space of fields, we do not consider F, which is smooth, which is closed, but we allow such a delta function singularity. Another way of saying it is that we remove the point and specify that the flux on a sphere S2 around it is one unit, so one unit of flux. We have one unit of flux on that thing. So we remove the point, and we postulate that there is one unit of flux on that sphere. And now we're going to do the functional integral, or whatever we do, with all the gauge fields with these prescribed boundary conditions. This is an interesting operator to study, and it has interesting correlation functions. In terms of this x, if we dualize a, in terms of a, a, it is like an insertion e to the i a. So imagine we insert in the functional integral. We're still doing free field theory. So a is a free field. Imagine we insert in the functional integral e to the i a. If we insert e to the i a, then the equation of motion of a, which was originally we had g3 square d a square. Now we have a delta function. So there's an i and a delta function of x at the point where we put the operator times a. This is the Lagrangian with the operator inserted. And if you solve the equation of motion from A for A from here, and you follow through the duality, you will see that it goes back to this equation. So this operator, which has A in the exponent, this operator that has A in the exponent, does this thing. So you can either think of the monopole operator as removing a point from space-time and violating the Bianchi identity at this point. So either remove a point and specify the flux, or do not remove the point and violate the Bianchi identity, or dualize everything and then do something which is very natural, e to the i a. Any questions about this construction of monopole operators? Now imagine the theory is supersymmetric. If the theory is supersymmetric with Susie, I've already said that the natural operator to study is x, which is e to the sigma over g3 square, plus i a. So we don't just insert e to the i a. The, the obvious thing to insert is just x. If we insert x in the functional integral, so we have both e to the i a and also sigma inserted at that point. Then, just as the computation is similar to the computation I did here, I get 1 over g3 squared. So what's the Lagrangian for sigma? We have the kinetic term that I just copied. Again, I emphasize, I'm doing free field theory. It's not fancier than that. It's free field theory. d sigma squared plus sigma over g3 squared with the delta function of x. No i. I really emphasize no i. The solution of the equation of motion of that tells us that sigma behaves like 1 over x, absolute value. So the field sigma, classically, tries to run to infinity near the insertion. Right? We insert an operator. So what A does, we've already discussed. In terms of A, we inserted flux for the gauge field. And in terms of sigma, Sigma runs to infinity as we approach this point, because we necessarily inserted sigma together with A. What does it mean in terms of the behavior of the field? 
Sigma does whatever it wants to do at generic points in space-time. But as we approach the point, sigma runs off to infinity. So the theory really explores this Coulomb branch. So we can put sigma wherever we want. We can put it at 0. We can have boundary conditions that nail it to 0. We can have some interactions that nail it to 0, whatever. Once we insert this operator, it drags sigma to infinity and allows us to explore the Coulomb branch. It allows us to explore this uh, Coulomb branch. And this is precisely the behavior. So this justifies, what have I done here? This justifies the something that we saw already in four dimensions. In four dimensions, in the supersymmetric theory, I quoted the theorem that the moduli space of vacua coming from solving the D-term equation is the same as the space of gauge invariant polynomials that we can write in the fields, subject to their relations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The same thing is true in three dimensions, but in a much more interesting way. In three dimensions, the gauge invariant polynomials that we have to consider do not use just the chiral superfields, but they should all, we should also include these monopole operators, these operators that look non-local. So we have these operators that no, look non-local, they're chiral. So we just follow the same rule. We have a modular space of vacua. The modular space of vacua is parametrized by some chiral superfields. And these chiral superfields could be either the chiral fields in the Lagrangian or these beasts. So that's something to remember as a new subtlety. I stapled these pages incorrectly, and I cannot find anything here. Now let's take this gauge field and couple it to our fermion. So again, the gauge field coupled to fermion. So what did we do? First we did just free fermion, then we did the free gauge field. Now we try to couple them together, but we are still doing just semi-classical physics. For that matter, we can think of these uh, x's as being classical. So one of the terms in the Lagrangian, and it's good to think of it starting from four dimensions, so the Lagrangian has all sorts of terms. One of them is that we have such a term in four dimensions. This term becomes in three dimensions psi bar sigma psi, because that's how was our rule, A4 becomes sigma. So now we are interested in these regions in field space where sigma is non-zero. This is this Coulomb branch. And you might say that you're not interested in such points in, in, the, in the modular space. You just want to work at the origin. But you still have these operators that will take you there whether you want it or not. Now, what happens if sigma is non-zero? Psi has a real mass. And this is a real mass. So even if phi, psi was originally massless, now it becomes massive. And when we integrate it out, we have an induced fern simons term. We can dress it up further. And imagine we have several psi's, and they have flavor symmetries, and so forth, and there are many u1's. We run to infinity, or we run very far in sigma, only in, with one gauge field. This is the photon that will eventually be dynamical. Such turn Simon's terms will be induced both for flavor currents and for flavor and gauge. What does it mean? It means that we have, imagine you have A1, and then we have DA2. And DA2 is, say, dynamical, and it's so I'll call it an A dynamical. And this is some flavor curve. So we induce such terms. We induce Chern Simons terms for the gauge field that we're going to think of as being dynamical in various flavor U1 currents. Now, notice what happens. We had this guy x, which had e to the i a plus sigma. And this, this operator said, we said, induces magnetic flux around it. And since it has magnetic flux around it, this guy has a non trivial expectation value. So we learn that in the effective action, in the presence of this guy, since we have such a term in the effective action, x induces this magnetic charge. 
And therefore, this x couples to the flavor current. So the upshot of all that is that x has flavor quantum numbers. So we start with a theory with some fermions coupled to one gauge field that we're going to really think of as being dynamical. We couple it to a bunch of, it has a number of global symmetries. Here we use the device coupling them to gauge fields, but we don't have to. So we have again a system with U1 gauge symmetry and some fermions and some global symmetry. The operator X necessarily has sim tra transformations under the global symmetry. In fact, already yesterday we saw non-trivial mixture between flavor and gauge. The dual gauge group that I described was SU and F minus NC. So what the dual gauge group was depended on what flavor exists in the problem. This is a cousin of the same phenomenon, except that here we can actually see it very explicitly. So we have a monopole operator that's a, in terms of traditional quantum field theory, this is a local operator. We should consider it as an operator. But now we see that it also transforms under various global symmetries. So this is a new element. This has nothing to do with supersymmetry. In supersymmetry, it becomes only more interesting. So I'll skip some things. So this is what I wanted to do with a billion gauge fields. We can make the, now we can make the gauge fields dynamical, integrate over them and make Eva happy because now there will be all sorts of fixed points. It will be very interesting and I can give a whole lecture about that, but that's not the direction I'm heading. Any questions so far? So far, I've got to say that every single thing I said was a free field theory. No questions. Yes, so I could have added, I could kill it by adding a bare churn Simon term, or I could tune the fermions, add more fermions to kill it. So this uh, should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, but the arithmetic that needs to be done is completely elementary. It all comes from this diagram. With the external lines, we don't even need the gauge field. This is a current. We are looking at this two-point function of the currents, and I already told you what the answer is. This is just 1 over 8 pi. So this is precisely the factor we are not interested in. So what you need to do is what charge appears here and what charge appears here, sum them up, multiply and sum them up. So you don't need to do the Feynman diagram every time. But everything is weighted with the sign of the mass of the particle. Right? So you're going to get, so what a, this diagram will give, so here we get Q1, depending on which gauge fields, here we get Q2, and this will give us the sign of the mass times Q1 times Q2, times various 8 pi's and A and DA and so forth we're not interested in. And now we just have to sum that over all, all particles. And this will give us this. This would be the coefficient. And we can do it for diagonal churn simultaneously, for off-diagonal, because these are different currents. We could do it for two gate, dynamical gauge fields, two classical gauge fields, classical and quantum, etc. But yeah, this is, again, something you count on. Once you know what you're doing, you just count on your fingers. It, there's no complicated calculation. This is not to say that I don't get it wrong. Ah, the excellent question. There is no problem. Uh, there is a problem. We cannot dualize it. But if we are along, if we turn on sigma, the fermions are massive. We integrate out the fermions and then we dualize the photon. Right. So that's this. Yeah. So without supersymmetry. In this case, we compute loops, and these flat directions will be lifted, and that's the end of it. With supersymmetry, loops do not lift it. So it's the same spirit of what I did in my first or second lecture. We go out along the flat direction. Some fields get mass. We integrate them out. In the low energy theory, we have a photon, no charged particles. And since there are no charged particles, I can dualize the photon. But this was an excellent question. Any more questions? No, I cannot. 
In fact, the Chern Simons term gives a mass to the photon. And since it gives a mass to the photon, it lifts the flat direction. So you see, it all ties together. I can dualize the photon when I have the flat direction, because then it really makes sense. If I have the Chern Simons term, I cannot. But there could be all sorts of phenomena, like there is a Chern Simons term that I put in by hand, another one, so it looks like there is no flat direction. But I try to move in field space. It gives mass to the fermion. I integrate out these fermions. That exactly cancels the Chern Simons term that I put in by that I put in by hand. Now I have a flat direction. So when I say dualize and all that, this is in the turn, this is the flat directions exist after I took into account the one loop contribution from the from the massive fermions. So let's take an example, just to demonstrate it. Imagine we have one U1 with one chiral superfield Q. In four dimensions, such a theory is anomalous, so we can, shouldn't study it. But in three dimensions, it's OK. The only remnant of the four-dimensional anomaly is this parity anomaly we talked about before. So this theory has a parity anomaly. The only way to make sense of it is to add K, which in some terminology, it's a half. This is the terminology that we normalize k with 1 over 4 pi. So we write k over 4 pi a dA. So we add k with a half, or with minus a half. We can put here 3 half also, but let's put a half. Now, imagine we didn't know about all the John simons term and all that. We are going to have a flat direction with sigma. And if everything would make sense, there would be an a, which is a circle around it. And there is an origin. And the mass of Q is precisely sigma, as I showed before. So if I go to positive sigma, the fermion has positive mass. If I go to negative sigma, the fermion has negative mass. So in here, I have k effective, which is a half, which I had a bare term, say minus a half. And in here, I have k effective equals a half plus a half equals 1. So since the, I have no, in the end of the day, I have no Chern Simons term in this half of space, and I do have Chern Simons term in this half of the modular space. So what this thing does is to kill this part of the modular space. But here, even though there was a bare Chern Simons term, the effective one vanishes, and I end up with the modular space of vacuum. I wanted to say a few words about the non-abelian gauge theory, because the fun is always when it's non-abelian. And I'm still in the previous millennium, unfortunately. So consider the SU2 theory. So we have three gauge fields and three sigmas. We can go along flat directions. So we can let sigma 3, say, be non-zero. But we cannot put all three sigmas to zero. Right? We have three gauge fields, so I set one of them to zero. So this is a Coulomb branch. For those of you who studied n equals 2 in four dimensions, there is a Coulomb branch in four dimensions. In n equals 2, here we have a Coulomb branch already in, in three dim already with n equals 1 in four dimensions, which is n equals 2 in, a, in three dimensions. So we have a Coulomb branch of vacua, and it satisfies sigma 3 is identified with minus sigma 3. That's the Weyl group of SU2. In addition, if we compactify in a circle, it's also identified with sigma 3 plus 1 over r. But let's temporarily set r to 0, so we forget that we came from four dimensions. So we have a modular space of vacuo. We can form our friend x to parameterize it. So what's the physics along the flat directions? Along the flat directions, we have an SU2 gauge theory spontaneously broken to u1. 
This is precisely the setup that Polyakov considered in ancient time. SU2 gauge theory spontaneously broken by fielding the adjoint to U1. And in this case, there are monopole configurations. Monopole configurations. Unlike the other monopoles that I described there, the monopoles I described there are things that we put in by hand. The theory does not have such monopole. These ones do exist in the theory. These are excitations. These are smooth configurations of the field. They do exist. And Polyakov wrote a beautiful paper showing that, so far, we don't even have supersymmetry. We don't need that. And Polyakov so showed that these monopoles induce confinement in three dimensions. It's a beautiful paper that, if you haven't studied, I strongly recommend that you look at. Then Affleck, Harvey, and Witten analyzed exactly the same monopole in the supersymmetric theory. And they showed that this monopole induces a superpotential, which is 1 over x in this notation. So we see here a situation which is very similar to the one I described in my first lecture, except that this is anti-historical order. This was actually one of the motivations to, for the discussion in four dimensions. So what did they show? They showed that an SU2 gauge theory, n equals 2 in three dimensions, which is the same counting as n equals 1 in four dimensions. There's an SU2 gauge theory. It has a classically, it has a flat direction. To all orders in perturbation theory, the flat direction is not lifted. But non-perturbatively, we have a potential along sigma that looks like that, thus leaving the theory without a ground state. So I'm not going to do that in detail. But let me make the system now a little bit more interesting. But consider not the three-dimensional theory, but the four-dimensional theory on the circle. What's the difference between the four-dimensional theory and the three-dimensional theory as far as symmetries? There's only one difference between them as far as global symmetries. The four-dimensional theory has an axial U1 symmetry, which is anomalous. I emphasized it before. It was an R symmetry. In three dimensions, this symmetry is gone. There's another U1R symmetry that comes in, but this symmetry is gone. So if we compactify on a finite circle, the low energy theory should not respect that U1 symmetry. So again, there's an R symmetry. I misspoke before. There is a U1R symmetry classically in four dimensions. In three dimensions, that U1R symmetry is exact quantum mechanically. But if we compactify the theory on a circle, the fact that there is a finite circle means that the U1R symmetry is violated. So we should take this term should still be there. So now we do the same theory on the circle, SU2 on R3 times S1 with radius R. And we ask, what's the effective superpotential? So one thing we can have is 1 over x. This is what they found. But we also need something that violates the U1 symmetry, the U1R symmetry. If you go through the quantum numbers, there's only one thing that can exist. This is our friend eta times x. In fact, you could, have you could have predicted this term as follows. I say that the theory has the modular space of vacua is subject to such an identification. This identification means that we can invert x goes to 1 over x. There's a factor of eta that I will not be able to get right. It depends that you see, this g sigma cube, si this sigma 3 is in the exponent, and it, it shifted by 1 over r. There's another g square that comes in. Together, they give e to the minus 1 over g4 square, which is precisely our friend eta. So I want 1 over x goes to eta x. I'll write it like that. This is an exact symmetry. What does this symmetry mean? It means that if we, if we compactify the theory on a circle, if we do not turn any Wilson line around the circle, A4 is 0, the SU2 is unbroken. Just think of it classically. Imagine we go all the way around, and we're doing a 2 pi rotation. If we're doing a 2 pi rotation, that's not the same point, because there's no identification. But the symmetry, but the SU2 is still unbroken. So the theory on the circle has an exact discrete symmetry that maps 
x to 1 over x. Now, what should the superpotential be? For eta going to 0, it should reproduce this answer, this pole. It should be holomorphic, and it should be invariant under this transformation. This is the only thing that it could be. That's actually quite nice, because let's look for the stationary points. To look for the stationary points, we differentiate it with respect to x. So we get min minus 1 over x squared plus eta equals 0. Equals zero. So eta is, sorry, x is 1 over square root of eta plus or minus. So what do we see? The theory on the circle has two vacua. And as eta goes to 0, which is the same as the three-dimensional limit, they are pushed off to infinity. We should have predicted that without doing any computation. The four-dimensional theory is SU2. It has two vacua. The SU2 theory has two vacua in four dimensions. By compactifying the theory on a big circle, this should still be true. The theory on a circle should still have two vacua. The three-dimensional theory, I told you, has no vacuum at all. Where did the vacua go? The only place they could go was to infinity. And this computation demonstrates it. Now, why did I tell you all that? I told you all that because now I'm going to have a real big jump. Because I'm going to ask the following question. Let's take a four-dimensional gauge theory, a much more complicated one, not just the SU2. Take a more complicated four-dimensional gauge theory, which has a dual. So we start with some theory with gauge group G and some matter fields and this and that. And it has a dual, gauge, a dual field theory with gauge group G tilde and some other matter fields and some interactions and so forth. If we dimensionally reduce these two theories to three dimensions, we do not find a dual pair. This shouldn't be surprising. This duality is valid only in the infrared. In the process of going to the infrared, in the process of compactifying, these two, pro these two operations don't commute. In one limit, we just go to very long distance to the infrared, and then we compactify. And in the other limit, we first compactify and then go to the infrared. We might not end up with the same theory. So from the early days of duality, people tried to guess dualities in three dimensions. And the first thing to guess is what you had in, three dim what you had in four dimensions, and that fails miserably. Yet people found some examples where, which are similar that do work. They were mostly motivated by some string considerations. But let's examine it more carefully. If we take these two different theories on the circle, so now I'll be very brief. I'll just outline the reasoning. If we took the naive dimensional reduction, just wrote the same Lagrangian in three dimensions, the first thing that would fail would be the symmetries. So the first thing that one should check if you have a dual pair is do they have the same global symmetries? And that would fail here because this theory had classically one U1 symmetry that we threw away because it was anomalous. This theory has some U1 symmetry that we threw away because it was anomalous. But in three dimensions, these two symmetries are non-anomalous. They are there, and nothing matches. The quantum numbers don't match. Nothing matches. But it's clear what needs to be done just by looking at this example. What we need to do is add to this theory in four. So imagine we start in four dimensions with these theories and compactify on a circle. Compactify on the circle, we'll have whatever we had before. And all we need to do is add here a monopole operator. That will explicitly break the U1 symmetry that we don't want. And on this side, we'll have whatever we had before. And we add eta tilde, x tilde. So now we have another putative duality to check. It's not the naive duality that we had in four dimensions. It's the same naive duality, but corrected by adding a monopole operator to the Lagrangian here and adding a monopole operator to the Lagrangian here. Now at least the symmetries match. The surprise is that now everything works. And by now, there are many powerful tests of duality, including computing indices. There's a huge industry doing that. And this recipe always works. So this way, we can, A, generate tons and tons of new dualities. Second, with one little qualification, all dualities that people guess in three dimensions can be derived from this prescription.
How much time do I still have? Well, you're coming at the end. So okay, so I'll wrap it up. Lecture, yeah, you know, well, I also started late because yeah, there was yeah, some... Yeah, you have a few minutes. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So my original plan was to give you the details of this and to show you how all the dualities work and the symmetries and so forth. But I don't have time, so I'll just wrap it up. First, more locally, this shows the duality that exists in four dimensions, exists also in three dimensions, and there are many examples. It's quite ubiquitous. Second, it shows that we can understand three-dimensional duality as starting its life as a four-dimensional duality. In three dimensions, we can do that with Chern Simon's terms. So, one very, very special case is that something known as level rank duality. This is a phenomenon in Chern Simon's theory, which has long history and very rich subject. It's related to physics in two dimensions and in three dimensions and so forth. Roughly taking UN gauge theory at level K and relating it to UK level N. So, it's a very strange duality. It was one of the first to be found. It actually follows from this reasoning. So the duality in four dimensions, if you bring it down carefully to three dimensions, namely you add these terms, and then you integrate out stuff, you can derive other dualities, including, for example, this level rank duality. This phenomenon of deriving consequences of field theory in low number of dimensions by studying some property in, four in higher dimensions is very common and very popular these days. A lot of people study the six-dimensional mysterious theory known as the two-zero theory. They compactify it on circles and tori and go into five dimensions, four dimensions, three dimensions, arbitrary manifolds, and so forth, and derive properties of the lower-dimensional theory that all you need to assume is that this six-dimensional theory exists. This is in the same spirit. We postulate some duality in four dimensions, and we derive many dualities in lower dimensions. So I'd like to really wrap up the whole series of lectures. What did we learn? First, we learned that field theory is still alive and kicking. There are many, many things to do, and it's really interesting. In this ex case of supersymmetry, the main thing that drives the show is this BPS thing, this uh, holomorphy BPS, chiral topological index. It comes under different names. All of the common thing in all of them, we are interested in objects that are annihilated by some supersymmetries, but not others. I also emphasize, and I would like to emphasize it again, that studying just this, yes, these objects are fun because we can study them, but this is a tiny piece, tiny sliver of what quantum field theory is. And if you match some chiral quantities, this does not yet tell you that you solved the theory, it does not yet tell you that you match the two theories. So that's a, an interesting warning sign. So this is the main technical thing. And I think that the main conceptual lesson that we learn is the role of duality, which we see is extremely common in four dimensions, three dimensions, we can go up and down in dimensions, we can turn on masses and derive different, different theories, and so forth. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Oh, that's a very good question. Historically or physically? Sure. Historically, yes. N equals 4 duality. The duality of N equals 4 was known before the 2 zero theory was known. And the 2 zero theory gave, in retrospect, the derivation of this duality. Similarly here, we started from duality in four dimensions. We derived some dualities in three dimensions. You can interpret it two different ways. Way number one, assume the duality in four dimensions and derive a duality in three. Or guess, doesn't matter how the three-dimensional duality, you, make enough, you perform enough checks to, to convince yourself that it's right. And then this is a consistency check of the four-dimensional theory. In fact, I'll make one comment. In the course of doing this thing, some things didn't work. Some examples didn't work. We examined a lot of examples, and some of them didn't work. And, and, then, and then we realized that the bug was actually in four dimensions. It wasn't a bug. It was a whole story in four dimensions. So this is an example of this thing. There were subtleties that in four dimensions were well hidden, but in three dimensions, they, they screamed at you. And 
which is again something that you, you, when you have a system, analyze it in all possible limits, compactify it, stretch it, uh, do whatever you can, because at some limit you might find something will not work. Something that is a tiny effect elsewhere, but becomes a big effect in a different limit. So I'll say one more thing. I'm here till the end of the day, so please come and ask me questions. I don't have to prepare TASI lectures anymore, so I'm completely free. <laughs>